My lecture today, as I announced yesterday, will be devoted to lattice basis reduction. And the role that is placed in my series of lectures is that lattice basis reduction is very helpful to do what I will mostly be doing on Thursday, which is called linear algebra over Z. And if I say linear algebra over Z, then I mean computations with finitely generated abelian groups. And those will, in our application, often be the additive groups of orders in number fields, their ideals, and also their residue classes. And what that is basis reduction does for you is that it helps keep the numbers small in the course of those algorithms, which is one of the major problems that one has to address in this area. So let me start by telling you what a lattice is, and there are two definitions that are often used, and the first makes use of the concept that you must know from linear algebra, and that is the concept of a Euclidean vector space. And a Euclidean vector space is, by definition, a finite dimensional, FD means finite dimensional vector space, VS means vector space, over R, and R means the reals. And such a vector space should be equipped. Let me call this vector space E, E for Euclidean, equipped with an inner product. And an inner product, as you may recall from linear algebra, that is a map from E times E to the reals. And this map should be bilinear over the reals. So if you fix one of the variables, it is linear in as a function of the other variable. It should be symmetric. X comma Y is Y comma X. And it should be positive definite which means that x comma x, the inner product of x with itself, is strictly positive if x is a non-zero vector in my vector space. And if you have such a vector space, then it has a metric. So then this E has a metric, the distance from x to y being, by definition, the square root of the inner product of the difference with itself. And that is indeed a metric. It satisfies the triangle inequality. It is only 0 if x is equal to y. And that metric also gives you a topology. And the Euclidean vector spaces that we will encounter are typically just Rn with the usual inner product. And it is a theorem from linear algebra that every Euclidean vector space is actually isomorphic to a unique such Rn including the metric. So that is a Euclidean vector space. And once you have the notion of a Euclidean vector space, then a lattice is defined to be, that is the first definition, is a discrete subgroup, capital L, let's call it, of a Euclidean E V S E V S means Euclidean vector space. And often one restricts this Euclidean vector space to being the space 
the subvector space is spanned by L itself. So if so, if we call this uh, E this vector space, then we say L is of full rank in E, and that will often be tacitly assumed if R spans if L spans E over R. So R L is by definition the real vector space spent by L, and you may as well make E a bit smaller if that is not already equal to E. And it is an uh, elementary theorem to show that every lattice is as a group, a free abelian group, isomorphic to Z to the N, where N is finite and is a non-negative integer. It is a rank of L. It is at most the dimension of E, and it will be equal to the dimension of E in the case of full rank. So that is the first definition. And this first definition also comes with a natural way of representing, first of all, a lattice. How do you input a lattice? How do you specify a lattice? How do you output a lattice into an algorithm? Well, you just write down a Euclidean vector space, for example, just Rn, and you list a set of linearly independent vectors in there. And then L will be the subgroup generated by those vectors. And the elements of L are likewise represented as vectors in E. In order to make this all meaningful in the context of algorithms, it is natural to require that L is not just sitting in your E, which you often present as Rn, but actually that it is sitting in Qn. So in the that the coordinates of all elements of L are rational numbers. And if you drive out the denominator, which you often can do without changing any of your problems, you often take it inside Zn. So then an element of L is simply represented as an n-tuple of integers, the inner product of two elements being the traditional inner product. That is the first definition. And it gives rise to the first possibility of specifying those lattices. That is not the one that I will typically be using. I will not start with a Euclidean vector space. I will just look at a finally generated Abelian group. So let me give you a second definition, which is equivalent to the first one, and that is the following. The lattice is a finally generated, Fg means finally generated, free abelian group, so that means isomorphic to Zn, and let's call it L, and it comes with some extra structure equipped with a map that I write in the same way, a map of two variables, both ranging over L, and this map that should be well symmetric again, x comma y is the same as y comma x. It should be bilinear, but not over the reals because L is not a real vector space but by linear over the integers. So that means that if you fix one of the arguments, then the map as a function of the other argument will be an additive group homomorphism. Symmetric and by linear, such that there is one more uh, property, namely that there is a positive real number, strictly positive, such that for all x in L, except the zero element, the inner product of x with itself, for which I will often write q of x, q because it is a quadratic function, is at least r. So that reflects the discreteness requirement 
in the other definition of all ethics. And this is often the way that we consider lattices. And before I get into the way of representing a lattice in this sense, let me tell you in what way these two definitions are equivalent. It is clear that if you have such a discrete subgroup, then, well, as I told you, it is finally generated free. And if you restrict the inner product on E to L, then you get a map satisfied all of these conditions. And conversely, once you have a lattice in the second sense, then you can take E to be the tensor product of L with the reals, which is a real vector space, which has a basis over the reals, which is equal to some basis of L over Z. You extend the inner product bilinearly to E times E. You sit down and you prove that E is indeed that the inner product, a Euclidean vector space, and then actually L is embedded into it in the sense that I mentioned here, it has full rank. The rank of L over Z is the dimension of E over the reals. And this gives rise to a different way of representing the elements of L, which is a little bit closer to the way I am going to apply lattice basis reduction. And that is as follows. You start from L being a free abelian group. So you may as well say that L is Z to the N itself. So the vectors of L, the elements of L, are represented by the coefficient vector on some basis of L over Z. And then you should not think, of course, that the inner product is the traditional one. So you also have to write down to the Gram matrix, as it is called. Gram was a Danish actuarial mathematician who lived from, let me say, uh, 1860 to 1916. And when he was 65 years of age, he walked to a meeting of the Danish Academy of Science. He was hit by a bicycle and he died. So that is the claim to fame of Gram, the Gram matrix. And this Gram matrix is simply the matrix, it's a symmetric matrix of inner products. And I call the, the basis vectors, I call BI. So BI is the element of L that here corresponds to the standard ith basis vectors of Z to the N. And if I and J range from one to n you get here a, a matrix of real numbers the inner products and those inner products because of the bilinearity determine the entire inner product and then if you want this matrix of inner products to really define a lattice it should be a symmetric matrix and it should be positive definite and for algorithmic purposes, it should have rational entries. And often we will simply assume that it has integer entries. And the way we are going to apply this in the context of linear algebra over Z is, well, here you have the type of objects, the Z to the N, that you want to work with when you do linear algebra over Z. And then you have a certain problem that you want to solve concerning maps and kernels and co-kernels and several other types of problems. And then what you do is that you encode your inner product, that you, that you encode your problem in terms of the inner product so that the properties that you are after are, can be determined, can be expressed by having vectors with, for example, a small norm. I will give examples of this, if not later today, then at least on Thursday. So, and in this case, the elements of L are simply integer vectors. Okay, so those are the two definitions. 
And it does for the rest of what I have to say today, not make much difference which one you prefer, but as I mentioned, the, my preference is in general with the second. So let me tell you a few basic properties of these lattices. First of all, I have to define for you the determinant of the lattice and the determinant of the lattice that is often called D of L and that is the determinant of L that is defined by taking a basis of L over Z and write down this gram matrix of inner products which is a symmetric positive definite matrix you take its determinant which is a positive real number and then you take the square root and you take the square root because that is what has uh, a nice interpretation if you take the, if you embed this l in this Euclidean vector space uh, as a sub group of full rank then you have because we have an inner product you have a natural volume for there and you can divide e by l that gives you a compact topological group which inherits a measure from the measure on e and the volume of that group which you can also interpret as the volume of a parallel letter bit that is spanned by the basis vector that volume is the square root of that determinant and that is independent of the choice of the basis as is already clear from this expression for computational purposes we will never take that square root because uh, when we do computations as i mentioned this will be this determinant will be a rational number or even an integer and there is no reason that the square root will also be a rational number of an integer so when you do computations with the determinant you just use the square of the determinant that will always be sufficient okay as i mentioned you can have several bases of the same lattice you can apply a whole matrix an invertible integer matrix n by n to such a basis to get another basis and what lattice basis reduction does for you is that it makes a particularly pleasant basis and pleasant has several definitions and i will give one that is appropriate for the reduction algorithm i will talk about but roughly speaking such a basis will be pleasant if the vectors in that basis are relatively short that they are maybe not quite orthogonal to each other orthogonal means inner product zero pairwise but at least that they have small inner products and once you have when you have a basis satisfying those conditions then you can solve several problems as i will make clear to you and the way in which you find a reduced basis a basis that is reduced in the sense of having those nice properties is that you start from an arbitrary basis for example the standard basis of zn and you start cleaning it up so to speak so you try to make it then for example orthogonal and that is done by a technique that depends on the gram suite orthogonalization process that you may know from linear algebra and that proceeds as follows so you start here from any basis which is the same as saying uh, sequence of 
linearly independent vectors in some Euclidean vector space. So you have B1, B2 through Bn. They are sitting in my Euclidean vector space and they generate my lattice if you like, but the lattice will for the moment not play much of a role, but we do want them to be linearly independent over the reals so that they generate as a group the, uh, the lattice and then you define an orthogonalization which you call b1 star b2 star through bn star and they also lie in e in fact they lie in the space spanned by the beads and you also define uh, real numbers, mu ij, they are sitting in reals. Here, the mu ij, they range over all i and j, where j is less than i. And the definition is as follows. So this b1 star is actually just b1. In general, bi star is bi minus a contribution coming from the smaller b stars so if i is one there are no smaller ones and then this sum whatever it is is going to be empty so b1 star is b1 but in general you have these coefficients that you use to subtract previous bj stars and what are these mu's well these mu's they are engineered in such a manner that all these B i stars are pairwise orthogonal. And that is what you may have seen also in linear algebra. That is what you achieve by taking mu i j to be the inner product of B j B i with B j star and you divide it by the inner product of bj star with itself and let me in case you have never seen it try to draw a picture of what is happening here so suppose that i have here a two-dimensional plane this blackboard and we have here b1 and we have here for example b2 and they are linearly independent and the two, if you orthogonalize them, then you want to subtract from B2 a multiple of B1 so that it becomes orthogonal. So if you take this projection, then you find here the mu 2 1 B1, that is this vector, and here you find the B2 star. So this mu 2 1 is the ratio of this length to the length of b1 it looks as if it is about three quarters and if you now add a third vector let's say that this is a vector perpendicular to uh, your screen then we can for example uh, do something like like this and here we have a b3 so that is in front of the blackboard and yeah in fact i don't know whether you can see this but your screen is of course two-dimensional my blackboard is a three-dimensional blackboard and this this arrow i drew perpendicular to the blackboard and b3 has also this distance to the blackboard then you have here the uh you have here the vector that you get by projecting b3 to the plane that is orthogonal to b1 so this vector there that is b3 minus mu 3 1 b1 or b1 star and then this one will be b3 star which you get from by subtracting from this element so this element is also equal to b3 star plus mu 3 2 b2 star so if you first project it orthogonal to B1, then you project it also orthogonal to B2, and this is your B2 star. 
and the mu's they are always the ratios of the vectors that you subtract to the length of the corresponding d one star so this mu is about minus three quarters it points in that direction whereas the the mu three uh, two will be about well i think it is about three mu three two is about plus three so that is what is happening here and you see that each bi star is the component of bi that is orthogonal to the space spanned by the previous b's and the previous b's that is the that is this space bj star which happens to be the same as the same space without the stars so that is orthogonalization and if you perform it then you end up with a set of orthogonal vectors but even if those inner products are integers that does not mean that those mu's are integers so there is no reason whatsoever that the group the additive group generated by the bees will be unchanged under this operation so that is something that we have to pay attention to and uh, what one can show here that is first of all that if you take this uh, this this uh, these ground matrices so maybe uh, what i do is the following so suppose that i take li to be the lattice of rank i generated by the first i b's so l0 is just a zero group l1 is just the group generated by b1 and ln will be l itself and if you star it then you get a in general a different lattice oh i see that i made a typo here this r should be z the lattice is generated by the b's over z and i do the same thing with uh with the bi star so you see that if you look at this two-dimensional plane again then my original l will consist of these points this point at uh, this b1 and b2 and and you have these things whereas the new lattice will be uh shifted a bit so that will be generated by this element and that element so that is really a rectangular uh, a rectangular lattice whereas the other one has an angle however it is the case that if you compute the determinants of those lattices then they are the same so the determinant of li will be the determinant of li star and what is also the case because this li star has a basis of orthogonal vectors the gram matrix will be a diagonal matrix any two different bi stars are orthogonal to each other so that means that you can conclude from what i am saying here that the that the length of this bi star the it is the square length actually the inner product of bi star with itself is actually the determinant the quotient of the two determinants of two successive lattices which you both square and that already gives rise to several interesting inequalities For example, it is quite clear this bi is equal to the bi star plus some error term you might call. So you see that this is at most q bi. And if you now take the product of these inequalities between positive real numbers over all i, and you uh, use the fact that l and l star have the same determinant and you see that the dl square 
is at most the product. Well, it is actually equal to the product of the QBI star, and it is at most the product of the QBI. That is called Hadamard's inequality, which is a very useful inequality if you want to do estimations, as you have to do when you prove that certain algorithms are running in polynomial time. Okay. Many of these things I am foregoing the proof of, and that is because they are, first of all, quite elementary and easy, and secondly, most of them you can find in the notes. And if you cannot find them in the notes, then they are even too trivial for the notes, in which case you find them in the exercises of the notes. Okay, so those are the, that is the gram smith organization. And using this bi star, I can define when I call a basis reduced. And that is what we are after. So let me erase these inequalities and uh, z basis so my basis for lattices are always understood to be z basis b1 through bn for a lattice l is called reduced if Two conditions are satisfied. The first is that for all i less than n, if you look at these gram schmidt orthogonalizations, then the lengths, well, you really like these lengths to form an increasing function of i. So I would really love to be able to require uh, this, th that this is true. But uh, I, I cannot really do this because such a basis may simply not exist. And you have to allow a certain slack here. And the easiest choice is just a half. This number two can be replaced by any number that is at least four thirds. And in fact, you can make it into a parameter as it has been done in the notes. But I will just stick to the number two, one over two. And then secondly, we have that for all j less than i, we want those integers, those real numbers, mu ij, to be no more than a half in absolute value. That is what I call a reduced basis. And what lattice basis reduction does for you is that it starts from any basis for your lattice and it changes it into a reduced basis. And before I tell you the essential mechanism behind that algorithm, let me tell you the first few properties, good properties of reduced basis, so that you have some motivation to actually uh, determine them. And one of them is, and I think most of those are again exercises in the notes or maybe proved in the notes. So if B1 through Bn is a reduced basis, then the first property is that b1 is pretty short i would love to be able to say that it is the shortest non-zero vector of l but that is not quite true but it is at most two to the n minus one times as long as the shortest non-zero vector so this is what i am claiming here if you take l not to be the zero that is then each vector that is non-zero is at least as long as your b n divided by this unfortunately somewhat exponential factor uh, one of the surprises of the 
uh, whole theory is that we will see many of these exponential factors and many applications don't seem to be bothered by them even though you would really find prefer to find a better approximation this is already for many applications good enough and this is for the shortest vector you can also look for what people might think of as the next shortest vector that has to be defined with some care i refer to the notes and you get the so-called successive minima but let me not talk about those uh, what is also true is that the qbi are not much longer than their stars yeah so as i told you a moment ago qbi star was no more than qbi and in fact they are of comparable size and that also means that with a reduced basis this hadamar inequality which uh yeah, i told you this hadamar inequality the product of um uh the qbi that is always true for any basis but if you take a reduced basis then you have actually an opposite inequality which you get by multiplying out this one over all i and then you get something like i think two to the power n times n minus one over two so you see that in this sense these qb these factors bi are almost orthogonal you have equality in hadamar if and only if all the bi coincide with the bi stars so that they are all orthogonal okay let me tell you one more good property of reduced bases which is not about finding short vectors in the lattice itself but finding short vectors in a coset of the lattice and this goes as follows suppose that i take f to be the following set so i take the sum from i is 1 to n and then i look at my vector space where everything is lying the bi star are an orthogonal basis for a certain subspace in there let's say the whole space in the full rank case and now we allow not integer coefficients or real coefficients we allow coefficients from minus a half to plus a half and this is the f that f means fundamental domain and that is because if you include f in e and i take e to l to be your full rank that is the full rank case and you take this torus you mod out by l then you have here a bijective map in other words each element of e for each x in e you have a unique pair y comma z with y in f and z in l such that x is y plus z so if you are given an element in the vector space then you like to round it to a lattice vector you like to find a lattice vector the z in this case so that is a good approximation to x in the sense that y is small and why it does look small because it lies in f and all these coefficients of f they are small and the good property of reduced basis is that this is uh, in a sense close to best possible and that is the following that if that uh, so if the basis is reduced then you have that is qy is again up to an exponential factor which is 2 to the n minus 1 in this case times the distance the square distance of x to the lattice so the square distance of x to the lattice that is the minimum of all square lengths of x minus w where w ranges over the lattice and you really like to make this small and you see that up to this factor you are managing 
pretty well. All this is due to the basis being reduced. Well, we will see plenty of other good properties of reduced basis. So, but I hope that this serves as sufficiently strong information for you to be interested in knowing how you make such a basis. And that is done by uh, lattice basis reduction algorithm and the most popular one which listens to the name LLL not because it involves three lattices that proceeds as follows so So the theorem is that there exists a PTA, and that is, as you may recall from yesterday, PTA means a polynomial time algorithm, maybe I should hide from this, a polynomial time algorithm that on input the lattice, and I told you how to input the lattice and elements of the lattice, in particular a basis, produces, that means outputs, a reduced basis for the same lattice. And I'm not going to tell you the total proof of this, but I will give you a sketch of the algorithm. And that is as follows. Well, you are given a basis already because in every way in which I told you to input the lattice, it comes with a basis. So B1, Bn is a given basis, but I am going to change it. And what I do first is that I test these conditions. And let me first look at the second condition. So if J is less than I and this new IJ is greater than a half, if you find such a pair, then you can decide to do something about it, namely then replace the I basis vector by itself from which you subtract an integer multiple of the j basis vector and that integer multiple you get by taking this number mu ij and you round it to a nearest integer and then when you look at the definitions of the mu's you will see that this particular mu by this process will be replaced by itself minus that rounding. So the new mu ij will be at most a half. So that is a step that you can take. And it is not so very difficult to show. It may be the subject of an exercise. But if you keep doing this, then at a certain moment, this second condition will be satisfied. In the notes, this condition I think is called a Gram Schmidt reduced for the basis. And of course, if there are several pairs, well, then you have a choice. There's a certain strategy that you can follow, which I do not want to say anything about. The second that may happen is that you find that this inequality is violated. So Q B I plus one star is actually quite short compared to q of b i star but in this case i want you to act only if the corresponding new has indeed been taken care of that this new is at most a half so the picture that you should think of here is that you have here 
is B I star. And here you have the B I plus one star. And then you have a mu that is between minus a half and plus a half. Let's say that is about a third, let's say. And then here you have this vector, which is B I plus one star plus the mu times the B I star, which is the projection of B I plus one orthogonal to the sum of the smaller BJs. This is the J's that are strictly smaller than I. So if you project B I and B I plus one orthogonal <coughs> to this I minus one dimensional space, then B I maps here, B I plus one maps there. And if I orthogonalize the I plus one also with respect to the I one, it goes there. And then you see that if this distance is at most one over square root two times the other distance that is what I have here, and this number is no more than a half, then what you can do, you swap bi and bi plus one. And the reason that you do this is that it enables you to make an improvement because then if I look at the Q of the new BI star, so that is the, the new BI is BI plus one and the new BI star is the projection of that one to this plane. So that will be this new one will be exactly the vector that I wrote down here. This is the old BI star plus BI plus one star plus the corresponding mu times the BI star. And you see that the, these are orthogonal. So this is the same as the Q of BI plus one star plus the square of the mu, the square of the mu times the Q of BI star. And that is at most, well, this is actually strictly less, a half times the old QBI star. And that is a quarter. So that gives you a half plus a quarter, which is three quarters times the QBI star. So if I make this swap, then it is very easy to see that all the BJ star are unchanged except the BI star. And the BI star, the new BI star will be, the square length will be at most three quarters of the square length of BI star. And that is really a big improvement because that means that every time that you apply this second step, then the product of all these determinants that I mentioned, that, let's take the squares, that this quantity for i is 1 to n, that it is, gets decreased by a factor three quarters or less. So that means that this number, which has a, if you think of it as an integer, it has some lower bound. That means that you cannot apply this step too often. And that means that after a number of steps that can be bounded in a good manner, you will find that you produce a reduced basis. Okay, so that is an outline of the lattice basis reduction algorithm. 
you do have to be a bit more careful in specifying which choices you make before you can prove this is polynomial time. But I will just be happy if you consult the literature about this. And then I will just take this result for granted. And the day after tomorrow, I will tell you how to use this in order to solve all sorts of problems in linear algebra over the integers. Okay, I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? So no questions. Oh, uh, it's it's something frozen on your end, or um, where I mean we don't see either of you anymore. I mean we see I we just see Don van Gent in the, the name, and can you hear us? Yes, now, now I can see and hear you. Okay, I think we had a freeze, but I guess it's the best time to have a freeze in this lecture. It, yeah, oh, you're, you're, it freezed right after you stopped talking, after you finished your lecture. Great. Well, actually, there was another thing I had to say, namely, congratulate you with your birthday. Happy birthday, Bjorn. Oh, thank you. Okay. All right, well, that wasn't a question, but are there other questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, the question may be what age you are getting. No, well, that's not the kind of question we're asking for here. Okay, so private. Not politically. Well, it's not very private. I mean, I think you can find it on Wikipedia, but <laughs> but anyway. Um, all right. So are there so I guess so there are some questions I think in the in the chat, perhaps. Let's see. So there's some question of there's some questions about why why the one half why why the constants in the in the definition of reduced basis why why use the constants one half? Well, I there's some question that um, it had to, you can replace it by any number by, that is uh, at most three quarters, right? Yeah, you you don't want this number to be getting beyond one. You want there to be some improvement. So if you replace a half by two thirds. That is still fine as long as the sum is less than one. If I really push it to the limits that the half becomes three quarters, then you get a one here, and then the only improvement is sitting in the in strict inequality sign, and that means that this integer, if it is an integer, it does decrease but not very quickly. So uh, what people often do is that rather than take a number like two, you take any parameter that you may choose yourself that is at least four thirds, so that the inverse is uh, at most three quarters. And then, yeah, then I think it is up to you. But I just, for simplicity, picked the number two, which is the easiest rational number to write down that is greater than four thirds. It has the smallest height. It is one plus one. OK, good. So let's see, are there other? I think I'm not sure if there are other specific questions that people want to ask. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask if you have a if you have a question that was not. Well, I have a question actually. If you do take two uh, three quarters, is it still polynomial time? The proof breaks down, but maybe it is polynomial time for some other reason. I think that is actually an open problem. In dimension two, well, actually in fixed dimension, I do think it is polynomial time. If you have, want to have something to think about, well, that's an interesting question. Replace a half by three quarters. Is there a polynomial time variant of this algorithm? Hmm. OK. OK. I questions, but I won't push it. OK. Um, any more? Okay, there's a question. Is there a notion of reduced basis for infinite dimensional lattices? 
Yeah, well, that is a good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, there are so-called Hilbert lattices. And I think we have been doing a lot with them, especially Dan, who is doing the problem workshop. But I do not think that lattice basis reduction is one of the subjects that we cover there. So there is the notion of a Hilbert lattice, which is a discrete uh, subgroup of a Hilbert space. And here's another open problem. Is any Hilbert lattice free as an abelian group? Open problem. Make yourself famous, solve my problems. <laughs> they, are, so they are actually what is called almost free. An abelian group is almost free by definition if every countable subgroup is free. Okay, so this is only a question for uncountable, uncountable dimension. Yeah, correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. The, the rank of a that is, is equal to the orthogonal dimension of the Hilbert space that it spans. Okay, so orthogonal dimension because I guess the yeah I guess the the, the actual dimension is yeah the, the, yeah. Basis, the when you talk about basis of Hilbert space it's not a uh, right true basis it's, it's, it's basis you say everything is a non, yeah okay not not everything is a linear combination but is is a infinite linear combination yeah okay so and those things also uh, occur in algebraic number theory mm -hmm. but that will take another fifty minutes to explain. Okay, so some other summer school. Good. Other summer school, good. <laughs> okay, any other questions? So I guess not. Now, now the next the next event. Okay, so thank you again. First of all. Okay, you're